first of all, good evening. Uh, thank you to the Institute for inviting me here to speak tonight. Uh, and thank you all for coming here to see me at 6 o'clock at night on a Wednesday night when I'm sure you'll be uh, thinking about other things. So as you would have gathered from my bio from Tanya, I'm not a structural engineer, but I started off my career as a physicist. So, but I didn't burst into flames when I walked through the door, so I only can think as part of the Institute's diversity program, but I will resist the temptation to derive everything from first principles, and I have avoided pages of equations. So, so before I really begin in earnest, I want to give you an overview of Thornton Tomasetti and where I sit in that organization. So Thornton Tomasetti is a 1,200-person organization providing engineering, design, investigation, consulting and analysis services to a variety of clients around the world. We have 34 offices in the US, Canada, Latin America, Europe. We've got offices in London, Edinburgh, Bristol so far, uh, and the Middle East and various offices in Asia. We, we really operate an integrated practice structure when we've got practices in structural engineering, uh, facade engineering, forensics, construction engineering, renewals, uh, sustainability, and a property loss consulting group who are quite busy at the moment. And, but uh, two years ago, we merged with Weidlinger Associates and added to that, we added three new practices, which is the Weidlinger Transportation Group, and Weidlinger Applied Science, and the Weidlinger Protected Design. So, I, so I'm office director for the Edinburgh office, uh, and where we actually operate is Thornton Tomasetti Defence. Uh, we, we provide what we call applied science and protected design services in, in the most part. Our applied science team does advanced numerical modelling and simulation, and it's really complemented by an explosive testing capability where, where we uh, validate our numerical models and we also validate the designs that we, that we, that we come up with. Our, our, our oh, wrong one. So uh, 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 our protected design team, which is my main focus, really provides a physical security analysis, advice and design to a range of architects, building owners, developers, and government agencies. And uh, so we assess vulnerability to multiple threats and hazards. We conduct blast analysis, design structures and facades to withstand the loads that we derive from these things. And we aim to really provide a balanced and economical uh, designs for every type of structure that we can come up with. We also design uh, hostile vehicle mitigation solutions and perimeter protection schemes and ass assess disproportionate collapse. This work is really done in collaboration with all the practices. We've all got a hook into facades and structural engineering and so on. And the aim is to achieve this appropriate design solutions. And with the main primary aim is really to craft those designs that provide that required level of protection without compromising architectural integrity. That's a, a fundamental tenet. So one way we achieve this is by ad really adhering to our primary corporate goal. And this is one that I'm really quite proud of, which is we've got to be the global driver of change and in, in, in innovation in our industry. And to do that, we really have an internal research and development practice whose real aim is to drive innovation throughout the whole company. And this really leads us on tonight's topic of blast analysis in the urban environment, where what I'm going to do is show you how the development of blast analysis has changed markedly over the past few years, and how I think we are changing the industry by providing software and tools which allow us to routinely assess and conduct complex analysis, such as what you're seeing on the left there, which shows a contour plot of a pressure time, uh, of, 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 a, of a pressure a snapshot in time from an explosive event. So here's what I intend to present to you tonight. Uh, I'm following the military briefing type process where you tell the audience what you're going to tell them, you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them. That just puts, you've got three chances at this. So what really I'm going to cover is really what an explosion looks like. And then I'll explain some of the background on blast shock waves and go, how we go about calculating some of those blast loads and what, how we use it in our design process. And then I'll, I'll briefly cover our, how we assess our structures to blast. But what I really want to cover and concentrate on is showing you how we calculate those blast loads in an urban environment and why it is so important including and, and, and to do this. And I'll also show you how we validated these models that we've come up with as well. So I've got some objectives. I've got objectives because my wife's a primary school teacher and she's always have to have learning objectives. So by the end of this lecture, you should be able to understand what an explosion looks like. You should be able to identify the different types of blast analysis methods that we've got and their limitations understand some of the assumptions that we required of the, the simplified tools that we've got. But most importantly, I want you to appreciate the complexity of these, these high-fidelity 
computational fluid dynamic blast tools that we've got. And finally, you should be able to judge when these different type blast analysis tools are applicable. So I'm going to start off with the video. So this is a video from uh, the 1996 uh, bombing of uh, Manchester. So that's quite a long time ago, 21 years ago, uh, that happened. Uh, so some of you might not have been around that much time. <laughs> Uh, but there was, for in this case, there was a telephone warning in the, in the centre of Manchester. There was a bomb and a truck. They evacuated 70,000 people from the shopping centre. It was on a Saturday morning. And they were all safely evacuated and there were no fatalities. And it was estimated to be about a 1,500 kilogram truck bomb. And that's the truck bomb in the centre. So what you'll see is the bomb going off. And if you look to the building to the, to the right there, you see this dust coming off. That's the facade breaking there. But what really this video shows is the devastation that you see in that city centre. Yeah? It was about £1.5 billion pounds worth of damage if it's, that's been correctly quantified. And it just shows you the, the level of destruction that we saw there. But none of these buildings collapsed. Yeah? A lot of it was... There was a, a lot of buildings had to be destroyed afterwards and moved around. What I particularly like about this video is the quintessential Royal Mail post box still standing in the middle of the explosion event. So if you want to know how to design structures, speak to the Royal Mail. A bit more of a scientific view. So this is an arena test where we are testing a blast-resistant curtain wall. What you've got here is a pile of explosives. Uh, what I want you to watch out for, and I'll show this video a couple of times, is I want to show you the, the, show the shock wave as it progresses across the ground and through the air. You'll see a slight shimmer as it does that. I want you to look at the reversal of flow at the top of the explosion. Do you see that moving down? I'll just show that just now. You see the initial flash. It's got this progression of the shock wave. The shock wave has gone up here by this point. And then it hits the window. And because we've designed it correctly, although the window breaks, it doesn't come flying into the room. So this is this, we've, we've achieved its primary purpose, which is to protect the people in the building. I'll just show that again. Again, look at the shock wave, the shimmering up there. It's very difficult to see here, but you can see it clearly there as that disturbing around. So what causes these blast loads? Yeah, so that's, that's, that's what we're here to find out. So the blast load is really it's just the shock wave that is caused by the detonation of that explosive material. And a detonation, all a detonation is, is a very fast, rapid combustion of a material. Yeah, it's faster than the speed of sound. That's what makes it a detonation. And this detonation wave travels at thousands of meters, meters per second in that explosive and once it reaches the end of the explosive, that all converts, that decomposes it into gas, uh, which then react. That high-pressure shock wave, then, as it leaves the explosive, produces a shock wave in the air. And that shock wave in the air is characterized by an instantaneous rise to a peak pressure. It then exponentially decays back to an, back to an ambient pressure over a characteristic ju ju really duration. And you see the, sort of the form of that exponential decay in this graph here. The area under the graph we call impulse. That's the energy under that pressure time history. And those, that peak pressure, impulse, and duration are the key characteristics of any blast shock wave. There are other secondary characteristics we get, such as the gas pressure loads that are produced, but they are really only uh, important for confined explosions, where you get a large rise in pressure caused within a confined space. Uh, you get fragmentation, which is a secondary effect, which we're, we're not really covering here, and thermal effects, again, which we're not going to talk about here. But the magnitude of this blast load is really dependent on a variety of factors, including the type of explosives. Yeah? So there's a big difference between a plastic explosive, such as C4 or P6 or whatever, and compared with gunpowder, for example. That can be considered an explosive in the right circumstances, but they have different types of characteristics. The amount of explosive is obvious. Yeah? The more explosive you've got, the worse the, 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 the blast wave that you're going to see from it. But the shape of that explosive is also important. Whether it's a sphere or a cylinder or a box of crates in the desert, that makes a difference, especially at short standoffs, to the form and nature of that explosive load. 
And what you see here is a graph at, of pressure time histories at three different distances away from 100 kilogram explosive event. And what you see here is that the explosion pre peak pressure drops off markedly. The first curve in red is at five meters. The green one is at seven and a half meters. And the blue one is at 10 meters. Yeah, so it drops off really, really quickly. So that's, 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 that's one of the greatest effects that you'll get uh, which characterise that explosion is the standoff distance or the range to the explosives, we call it, but also what the orientation to the, uh, of the loaded surface is. Just a bit more terminology. So this is just a blast shock wave. This is, you'll find this in all the usual literature. We have, this is a pressure gauge measurement at a point in space. Yeah? So before the explosion, you start off at ambient pressure. The shock wave romps along, and you get this instantaneous rise to peak pressure. Yeah? In this case, we've called it a peak side on overpressure, so there's no reflections here going on. That exponentially decays, and depending on the size and magnitude of the event and how far away you are from the explosion, you can also get a negative phase. So that negative phase is caused by this massive outrush of air, leaves essentially a partial vacuum in there which tries to come back. That's essentially what you're doing. So that equalization can cause another effect, which is really important. That's the, the sucking down of the, of the of gas at the, at the video that you saw. So all of these parts of this time history are important. So we term that area underneath the graph positive impulse. What we often do is we simplify that. As engineers, we want to simplify things to a simple triangular pressure loading, and then we alter the duration of that to match uh, the, 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 the original impulse. So this is really all that we as engineers are, for the most part, are interested in. Uh, so a few characteristics of the shock wave that we, we've already mentioned, touched on already, is that when it uh, uh, expands, the shock wave changes in form. Yeah. So what happens is we've got a, a bomb here, and we've got a pressure gauge here. We see our simplified pressure time history. You see a peak pressure and it lasts for a certain amount of time. Further away, that peak pressure reduces, but the duration gets longer. Third one, further away again, peak pressure reduces again, but the duration increases, giving us the three figures that we saw before. Okay? So what I want you to try and do is try and remember some of these figures. So at that five meters, we've just got over one megapascal in pressure, peak pressure. It's lasting probably about, I don't know, five or six milliseconds. The green one is just over 400 kilopascals. The blue one, that's the one I want to particularly remember, is about 240 kilopascals, 250 kilopascals, lasting probably just about seven or eight, nine milliseconds. So one of the complications we've got with a blast shock wave is how they actually interact with structure. This is what we are interested in as engineers. So the bottom line is, is when a shock wave is reflected from a surface, it's magnified. Yeah? How the amount it's magnified or its reflection coefficient depends upon the angle of reflection, so that the angle of attack which that blast shock wave hits it. So if a shock wave hits it normally, it would be a different reflection coefficient to when it comes at an angle. But to complicate matters, the magnitude of that reflection also uh, that reflection coefficient depends upon the magnitude of the initial pressure time history that you're seeing. There are lots of reasons for this change in pressure. It's to do with conservation of momentum when it hits a structure, and there's a whole page of equations I can show you for that, but I'll not do that. I'll, I'll, I'll not let you suffer that. But the graph on the left shows really what I'm trying to talk about here. So in this case, this is reflection coefficient on the y-axis, and here's angle of instance. So angle of instance being zero, it's when a shock wave would just be romping in from the left here to the right, hitting that surface normally. It's a normal reflection. At 90 degrees would be a shock wave traveling along that surface. We call that, a, 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 there's no reflection, we call that a side-on overpressure. So if we look at this graph here, this graph shows you what the reflection coefficient is according to that angle of instance. And there's a number of lines on here, and these lines all correspond to a magnitude of that initial shock wave. So at this end here, at a low level shock, or even an, an acoustic 
sound wave, for example, could be down at that level. What you get is, you, for a normally reflected wave, you get a reflection coefficient of 2. So that peak pressure would double up to 2 for a, for a low-level low pressure wave. As we get higher to a really strong shock wave, that coefficient of, reflection, of, of, uh, uh, that coefficient of reflection can go up to 12. So 12 times the pressure, so from a 1 megapascal pressure, it actually, the structure actually sees 12 megapascals. So I'm hoping you can see why that might be a problem. Let me just go back a second. So another issue is that reflections add up. So when we've got a re-entrant corner or an inside of a building, you've got this shock wave, which is emanating from this explosion. And we're interested in the loading on a particular part of that structure. It sees the initial shock wave. Yeah, it's a triangular-shaped load. It sees one, which is a perfect reflection of one of the sides. But that's a longer path length to get there. So it takes longer to get there. And it's lower pressure, because we know pressure reduces significantly with range, and its duration increases. We also get one off the back wall going onto that target. So the actual loading on a, any particular space can be a combination of lots of different reflections. And so what you get there is these shock waves combined, and effectively you get a longer wavelength shock pulse, okay? which can cause you that increased energy, increased impulse can cause you difficulties. So just to show you this in action, what I've got here is an analysis where we've got an explosion within, uh, between two walls. And these walls are a few meters high. And it's actually a three-dimensional analysis, but you're seeing it in plan view. So what you'll see is this shock wave will emanate, progress up this tube here. You'll see reflections bouncing backwards and forwards. And you'll also see that the shock wave as it goes over the wall and out the other side. As you see that these multiple reflections bounce, bounce backwards and forwards. So you, you can appreciate that the time history on any part of this wall could be quite complicated. So what I've done here is I've shown you a few graphs of pressure gauges which would be on that wall. And in this case, we actually started, I've got three graphs showing three different situations with the walls at different widths. So the first case is where the walls are quite far apart. So you get peak pressure, followed by some smaller reflections because the walls are quite far apart. As you move the walls closer together, this latter phase starts to become more important. You actually get an increase in the initial peak pressure because we've moved the walls closer. But you also get this an increase in these reflections as well until you can get a really quite complicated pressure time history where you're getting these multiple reflections at quite high pressures, which you've got to account for. So how do we calculate what these blast loads are? So there's three main methods that we, that we look at. One of the, the West most well-established is what we call the, the, is, is empirical relations. So this is uh, equations and relationships based upon huge amounts of test data and detonics theory. Yeah? Most of this test data is measured in arena tests like this one here. So it's a similar blast test that you saw earlier. See the shockwave propagating over. But there they will have multiple pressure gauges at different standoff distances, different types of surface, reflecting surfaces, uh, in order to compile what the characteristics are, pressure, impulse, time of arrival, you name it. But all those empirical relations were really derived from very simple free field tests without any structures interacting. We weren't interested in the structures, we're just trying to quantify these, these pressures. And what we what, what, they, what they came up with when they did this work was uh, a whole series of scaled curves. Now, these are all published in uh, a snappily titled UFC document, which is Unified Facilities Criteria document, a US document 34001, which is the design and analysis of structures to conventional weapons effects, and the UFC 33402, which is structures designed to risk the effects of accidental explosions. I knew those as TM5855 and TM5300. Uh, but it's the same information, just, just, just put in a newer form. And what these curves are, are defined by what we call a scale distance. What they, what they obviously found was that 
at different explosives at different standoffs produced similar results. And what they found was that if you plot scale distance in terms of uh, uh, range away from the explosive, R divided by the explosive uh, weight to the power of a third, they were able to plot consistent uh, measures for uh, peak pressure, peak instant pressure, peak reflected pressure, which is the red line, and then also impulse as these changes. So as, in, as the scale distance increases, these magnitudes decrease down. So that was a very handy way to describe a lot of the effects from explosions from a whole range of scale distances, uh, which is very, very readily used. Now, this has been incorporated into many different software packages. CONWEP, Conventional Weapons Effects, is a, is a piece of software distributed by the uh, US Army Protective Design Center. It's not readily available in the UK, uh, but we can get a hold of it, or we, we do have a hold of it. Uh, and we've also packaged it into very simplistic analysis tools as well. But what this allows us to do is look at those scaled graphs and then using only a charge weight of TNT, so I've got 100 kilograms here, a distance, which is 10 meters, and whether it explosions on the ground or not, and here I've assumed this hemispherical surface burst, this tells you what the pressure time history you would expect at 10 meters away from that explosion. In this case, it's 240 kilopascals, it's got a, a range of uh, a, a, a duration of 9.7 milliseconds uh, and a, a, an impulse of 0.6 megapascal milliseconds. So from that information, we can use that in other tools. It gives you the peak reflected pressure. So we've got this reflected pressure here of 845, 845 kilopascals. If you cast your mind back to the reflection coefficient, if you are normally reflected, graph at 240, megapascal, 240 kilopascals gives you a reflection coefficient of 3.5. This is 3.5 times that instant pressure. It's just using those same relations. That's all it is. Really usefully is that you get graphs like this. So this is pressure versus range. So how far away you get from your explosion gives you what the pre peak pressure is. And this clearly shows this fall off in pressure on a log scale for a range. And so if there's any architects out there, so when your blast engineer is trying to move your perimeter as far as way as possible from your building, this is why he's doing it, because he can significantly reduce the loads on the building and give himself an easier time. Yeah? Blast engineers are inherently lazy. Yeah? <laughs> they will want to give themselves an easier time as possible. Other things that Conweb gives you or that these types of tools give you are contour plots on the pressure distribution of a flat surface or a wall. So this example, it's the same 100 kilograms at 10 meters away. You've got a flat wall that's 10 meters away. What I've done is I've made the wall 20 meters wide and 20 meters tall. Yeah. So that peak there is 850 kilopascals. That's exactly what we worked out as a reflected pressure earlier. But what you can see here is that falls off dramatically down to almost 100 kilopascals towards the top of that. So if you're an engineer, how do you use that information in your design? Do you assume an equivalent static load? So what static load should you assume? It's the same across the whole panel. Which one do you use? Impulse. Impulse is slightly different as well. So you've got a similar issue with the fall off in, in distance, that geometrical distance. But around the edges, you'll notice here that it falls off very rapidly. So that's an additional effect which complicates it with structures called clearing. So when the shock wave reaches a wall edge, it actually uh, relieves itself. So it's, it, 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 it really dissipates, so you get a, a significantly reduced impulse around those edges. That can make a big difference in the design of your structure if you're interested in using it. Ray tracing software. So ray tracing software is very similar to the method that I showed you earlier by calculating up those simple ray traces. <laughs> It can really only be used for the simplistic of geometries. Blastex is one of the pieces of software out there. They are quick running because it doesn't take a lot of effort to do it, but they just use the empirical equations for reflection in the background. That's all they're doing. And the output is generally a pressure time history of that sort of nature. But they're limited in what you can do because of the simplistic nature of the geometry that you've got. So it's just a screenshot of Blastex, one of the codes out there. I don't tend to use that piece of software uh, much. 
And the other part, which I use a lot more of, is computational fluid dynamics. So this is software known as hydrocodes. Now, hydrocodes have been around for 20-odd years in looking at it, but it's only really just recently that we've been able to use them practically in a, in a design sense. And so these methods, CFD methods, really rely on the first principle physical equations yeah, for uh, uh, wave propagation. Uh, and that's the Navier-Stokes equations. I'm not going to go into detail on those. I promise you no equations, but they're essentially ensuring conservation of mass, momentum, and energy for the explosive event. That's really all they're doing. And there's a lot, a lot of numerical schemes which optimize the, the, with the wave prop shock wave propagation, and some even explicitly account for different types of explosives with different equations of state. And what the movie, what the movie shows is a hydrocode simulation. Uh, it's actually a maze calculation. This is something that our or my U.S. colleagues use a lot. Uh, and this allows you here. Here we're calculating the pressure time history at multiple locations in that domain. So in, in a finite element sense, it's every element has got a pressure time history associated with it. And we can use that information. Now, in the U.K., what we've done is we've, and it's been part of our innovation, is we've developed a fast-running CFD tool, which really runs on... Uh, graphics process units, the gaming cards that people have in their PCs. So we can run, these are very cheap, they support thousands of computational cores, and which means we can either run very fine detailed resolution models, or more importantly for this particular uh, avenue here, arena here, is we can run very large computational domains. Yeah. So what is the difference? Well, you've sort of hinted at it already. So this, this is uh, a, 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 a picture, a snapshot of a, of a Revit model. We've got these tools for calculating the blast loads and structure incorporated into our BIM tool Revit. Yeah, so it takes a, a straight line of sight from wherever our bomb is and computes what the loads are on that structure. We've got some rules for doing things out of line of sight, but it's, it's, it's rules of thumb. They're not, they're not, uh, uh, they're, they're not in any way uh, uh, accurate, and we err on the side of conservatism. The picture on the uh, right is uh, a view of a, a, a CFD model, a, a wireless simulation of a, a, one of the large-scale CFD analysis that we've got. It allows us to determine the peak pressure, time history around loads of uh, around the domain. So in this case, the bomb was there, and we've got explosion pressures <coughs> up around these corners here, away from line of sight. How can you accurately do that? You can't do it with ray tracing. The only way you can do it with these CFD methods. And it's a much more powerful tool than the empirical equations on their own. So what are the draw are there any drawbacks to using the empirical methods? Yeah? So yes, there are. The empirical methods that we've got are useless at low scaled ranges. Yeah? So very close in uh, to the to the explosive do not give you good answers. Part of the reason was when they did these tests. Uh, many years ago, they didn't have the instrumentation to measure this, these pressures accurately at these, these levels. Yeah? But there's an awful lot going on with the physics at that close into the explosion as well. There's a lot of debris coming from the, from the explosion itself. So these equations are not reliable at close in. These equations, we've touched on it already, can't capture the complex geometries. There's no reflections, there's no interactions with the structures possible other than direct line of sight. As I said, we've got rules that we can do to, to test that and to give some conservative assumptions on it, but it's an assumption. Yeah? So we can't propagate around corners, and so we can't go through openings easily either, so that, that stops all that type of analysis that you would be interested in doing. Use of these methods can be conservative. Yeah? Like I said, for the line of sight issue, if it's out of line of sight, we assume it's in line of sight. Actually, we're not taking account of the shielding, therefore you're going to get a more conservative answer. They could be unconservative. So by not taking account reflections, you saw that we would underestimate the impulse. Yeah? So which is it going to be, conservative or unconservative? How are we going to use these things? So why not use CFD all the time? <laughs> if these are so good, why don't we do this all the time? Well, again, engineers are lazy. The empirical methods are so much faster. There's no model to develop. You've got a charge weight, a distance, a, some idea about what the reflecting surfaces are, and you've got a reasonable design load. Yeah? 
and it's specified in documentation such as the UFC documents, they, these are almost a, an industry standard. So every engineer is using similar information. And to be honest, that is good enough for a lot of our protective design problems. You, we don't always need to go down the CFD route. You know? Anybody that tells you that you have to is not addressing the problem correctly. There's, there must be a reason why you go down this route other than the, the, the empirical methods. Many of the structural analysis methods that we use can't use the time histories that you're getting from these types of analysis. Yeah, the, you've, not, you've got not the opportunity, they've not, they've not got the correct integration method uh, scheme to do the, do the analysis, then a final resolution, so we just can't do it. And one thing to be wary of is sometimes you get a false sense of accuracy with your CFD model. Yeah? These CFD models can be really accurate. It's very user-dependent, information-dependent. But whilst the results are accurate, you must remember that we're very often just using it as a design tool. Yeah? And if we, so if we're using it as a design tool, what are we using? So are we assuming a 100 kilogram threat? Yeah? So we're using, okay, that's fine. You do the analysis, you've got a 100 kilogram threat. What if this threat's actually 150 kilograms of explosive? Yeah? So you've got to be wary, you've got to understand why you're doing it. It's why doing a threat vulnerability assessment is really a key part of what you have to do here as well, to understand what the design threat that you're doing. Because once you design a structure to that, you've designed it. So when do we really need to use these CFD methods? So we really need to use them when the complexity of that pressure time history is important. Yeah? So this is often after we've done some real simple analysis and we can't make it work. Why can't we make it work? Because we've got too much conservatism in, in there for whatever reason. So a more accurate pressure time history, it could include the negative phase, it could have all sorts of other things in there, which gives us the performance that we need. Yeah? Uh, static design methods are generally too, too conservative as well. We, 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 we're generally specifying an equivalent static load, which for the most part is going to be overestimating the load on the structure. For some parts of it, it's going to be underestimating it. And if we're using a single degree of freedom method, these methods really may be insufficient if, we're, if we're, what we're analysing is not a single degree of freedom. And so this is a typical uh, problem like that. So the, 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 there's more, you've got the glazing response, you've got the mullion response, you've got the transom response. All these, are, are, it's a multiple degree of freedom problem. So we need, to, and we also need to use CFD when we want to know what happened during an explosive event. Yeah? Using simplified blast loads to back calculate what happened in a certain situation is no good because it's the very variations in geometry that you're looking for. So only a CFD analysis can do that. And more particular, we need to use a CFD analysis when the loading environment is really complex, when you know that you can't make the, the assumptions that you're trying to do. And this really happens in things like what we're calling Urban Canyon and internal explosion events where you've got a, a really complicated pressure environment. So really for the next part of this presentation, I'm really going to concentrate on, on these sort of three points on some, some uh, uh, limited structural response uh, 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 methods. And really I, I want to focus on and show you some examples of the urban canyon effect and what I mean by that and how this fits in with the urban environment. So there are many, many methods to calculate structural response to blast. Yeah. One of the most common ones is this, what's called the single degree of freedom method. This is where we represent a more complex structure with a simple equivalent single degree of freedom or mass spring system. And this really allows us to calculate that dynamic response very quickly, very simply. But even that leads us to some fairly complex issues. So once you've actually defined your structural system as an equivalent single degree of freedom system, and this, this could be representative of a beam or a slab. You come up with some effective uh, uh, stiffness, effective mass. You can generate a single degree of freedom system. You look at Big's introduction to structural dynamics, you'll get all the transformation factors you need to determine an equivalent system for most of our structural systems that we're interested in. But once you've got that equivalent single degree of freedom system defined, you can you can work out the total structural response by looking at the dynamic equations of motions. Once you've solved it for that, you can solve, you get the full response time history, you get the full 
deflection criteria that you're aiming about. And for most of the time, for single degree freedom analysis, a lot of the time, all we're interested in is working out what maximum deflection is acceptable. Yeah? But when we look at, when we solve these single degree of freedom equations, we actually figure out that there's a link between the duration of the blast loading and the duration of the natural frequency of the structure that we're actually considering. So this is a complication we've got to take into account. So up on the top right there, if you've got a load duration of the blast, which is really long compared to the natural frequency of the structure. So this happens for when you've got large explosions at lar large distances away. Yeah? What we do is we find that the maximum deflection is really directly dependent upon the peak pressure. Let's call that, we call that pressure dependent. That load, the electrotron forms in, into this, this stiffness of single degree free model, which translates to a deflection. It's as simple as that. When the load duration of the blast load is really short compared to the natural frequency of the structure, what we get is a situation where the structure can't respond before the loading's been and gone. So at, at blast load, you've seen some of the durations there, 9 milliseconds, 10 milliseconds. Yeah? That's quite a high frequency equivalent. Some of our building natural frequencies are a lot less than that, so they don't necessarily uh, can't respond to that in the time frame. But what we find in that situation is that the deflection that we get is dependent upon that energy or that peak in plus, and we call that impulse dependent. Oh, wrong one. Impulse dependent. So once you've got that, excuse me. So once you've got that, when the load is actually comparable blast load frequency is comparable to the natural frequency of the structure, you get strange things happening because you're getting resonances. Yeah? We all know from a single degree of freedom system, if you excite it at its natural frequency, it goes into the resonance, uh, which can be quite, quite high. So and that, in, that, in that regime, the assessment of the deflection time history is really much more complex. And what we need to do is get the complete solution of that equation of motion for that structure. And we find in this case that that, de that deflection time history that we get is directly dependent upon the shape or the form of that pressure time history that we're putting into there. So if you've got a simple triangular loading into the same single degree of freedom system and you've got our equivalent real blast load, you will get a different answer yeah, because the form of the deflection time history is directly dependent upon the form of the load time history. And we call that pressure time dependent regime or dynamic regime. Yeah? And these are three, the three key regimes that we're interested in. But these three key regimes allow us to evaluate the limits of the response of this single degree freedom system. And this allows us to plot what we call an iso damage contour plot or a pressure impulse curve. These are really common in the blast engineering environment. So if we evaluate the response in the pressure regime, this is the pressure regime here, so this is where the impulse doesn't matter. Yeah. We've just got an increase in pressure. And so increasing that peak pressure changes the deflection or damage that we see regardless of the energy of that blast wave. Doesn't matter what the impulse is, the same damage level is seen. So that damage level could be a, a maximum strain level or a maximum deflection. It could be any form of metric that we want to use here. And what we find is we get this pressure asymptote when we solve the, 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 uh, the equations of motion. In the impulsive regime, that energy imparted to the structure by the blast wave causes an instantaneous velocity change in the structure. Momentum is required by the structure, and then that converts to kinetic energy, which converts to strain energy or deflection. And then we can estimate in that impulsive regime where pressure doesn't matter what that impulsive asymptote is. So we can then infer in the regime in the middle or do some analysis, but we can infer that that can be estimated what it happens in that dynamic regime. So just by knowing the pressure and impulse of an explosive event and a set of PI curves, we can tell how much damage we do to structures. Yeah? So that could be a certain damage level or a rotation level of a beam or something like that. And then we know if we get a Pressure and impulse in this regime here, 
it's going to be greater than that, and it's less than that, so you get these transition marks, transition contour lines. So in a real case, so this is, this is taken from uh, David Cormier's and Jeff May's book on uh, blast effects on buildings. So this looks at, this is a pressure impulse contour plot, isodamage contour plot for brick buildings. It's based upon World, World War II data, when we had a lot of data points to work through. Helpfully, the pressure axis is here and the impulse is on that side. But what we've overlaid and on here are different damage categories. So in this regime here, you would get complete demolition of your building, transitioning down to an area here where you get urgent repair. Yeah, there's different degrees of that damage. And what they did in the latter end of the war was they, they, they surveyed, surveyed all the damage that occurred from buildings. They knew where all the bombs went off, and they plotted that we were able to work out these pressure impulse curves. What we are able to do is put on top of that what we call a range charge weight overlay. In this case, we've got uh, a 250-pound bomb, but at 10 meters, it causes this pressure and impulse. At 20 meters, it causes this. 50 meters causes this. 100 causes that. Yeah? So we can overlay, and again, very quickly, say, we know, if we know that building is so far away, we can work out exactly what the pressure impulse is in that and tell you whether the building's damaged or not. So we use that in a very generic sense. When single degree of freedom methods are inf insufficient, so when we're interested in really close in loads, uh, or single degree of me methods are too conservative, or it's not a single degree of freedom system, we, are, we can use the loads from a CFD analysis, and we often put these into a more detailed finite element simulation. So this is a finite element simulation of a close in device near a column, a structural wall, uh, and a couple of bays. And what we're showing on the bottom here was damage. And up there was a stress wave propagating through the structure. What I'll do is I'll play that again, if I can. And here you can see at much later time we get some damage occurring. You can't do that with a single degree of freedom analysis method. And we use this type of thing to help us design our mitigation for close in events into, into structural columns. So, getting back to the urban canyon or the urban environment. So when I mentioned that the loading environment is complex, we need to use CFD methods to conduct this type of blast analysis. So the urban canyon type situation is one of these types of situations. So this is 42nd Street in Manhattan. And that's really what we mean by an urban canyon. It's a very congested environment. There's built really tall buildings all the way around it. And this is not really a new concept. So Back in the mid-70s, a lot of, still is a lot of work going on the urban canyon effects where you've got pedestrian comfort, you've got this Venturi effect where you're getting a concentrating of wind loads into, into confined spaces. Uh, uh, and I'm sure if any of you have been in New York in February trying to walk up a street, you'll, uh, you'll be struggling against the wind in certain parts, of the, certain parts of the city. So what, in the context of blast loading, it's really only recently, as I mentioned, that the CFD tools are fast enough to be able to handle the large domain sizes that we need to look at a citywide explosive event. So this is an example of Midtown Manhattan. I, I just did this as a, as a toy problem for this. I didn't want to point out any clients, so I'm not interested in any particular building, so uh, don't read into anything that I, I may or may not say. Uh, but this is Midtown Manhattan. Yeah, fairly congested. Uh, environment, you might say, uh, in plan view, looks like this. For you city spotters, that's Fifth Avenue. That's the Rockefeller Center. That's St. Patrick's Cathedral, and you've got Broadway up the side there. So we're, we're modeling a, a fair-sized domain here. It's like a good kilometer either side. So what I wanted to do is to look at, uh, and really what I did was I did four analysis scenarios. I looked at two charge locations, one on the corner of 5th uh, and, fifth and 50, 50th, or something like that, and one in Rockefeller Plaza itself. And I, look, I actually looked at a 1,000 kilogram charge weight and a 5,000 kilogram charge weight. I'm only going to show you the results from one of those analyses of the 1,000 kilograms. But this is a this fluid uh, CFD model is 380 million cells that we had to use to get that domain correctly. And we ran those four scenarios and we ran them overnight. 
yeah, and set these going in the computer. Came back the next morning, everything was all done. Thank you very much. I made that domain really big just to see how far we could push it with that. We've actually gone up to 2 billion cells, and that's the most we can do for our computational capability. But that's, that's, the, that's the type of analysis that we can do. So I'm just going to show you a few animations and a few pictures just to, just to illustrate really what I'm talking about, this urban canyon environment. So this contour plot is just showing a progression of peak pressure. So I'm not showing pressure evolving, I'm showing peak pressure evolving. So it's, it's a more simpler plot to look at. And all you just see is the maximum pressure that you're going to see across the buildings. And you can start to see it's quite a congested. You're seeing pressures going up the sides of the buildings, around the buildings, and so on. So that's, that's the one on the, in the, at the intersection. The scenario two is the same one, except it's moved over to Rockefeller Plaza. And you can see a little bit of difference between the two, but they might just look the same. It's easier if you look at it in the same graph. So this is zoomed in, closed up, both have them run. So this is the final state. So as you can see here, so this is the building just north of St. Patrick's Cathedral, right in the corner of where that bomb is. You can see the entire uh, uh, facade here is red, and that red contour level is 900 kilopascals. It's an arbitrary level at this point. But it was chosen so I could show you it from the next scenario, which just moved along a little bit. We're seeing that there's almost a significant reduction in the pressure in that building, which is not, not that far away from it, but it's being shielded by parts of other buildings. Other parts of it, this building here, is out of line of sight of that second shot, of that second charge weight, but it's seeing more pressure than this one here. Same with down this, down this end of the building here. So looking in plan view, what you're really seeing is the extent of that overpressure. So here what I've plotted is the same pressure at ground level, but I've made the contouring, I've, I've, what I've made the contour, the red contour represents what we call a five, it's a five kilopascal level. And that's a, that's a peak pressure that we use in magazine safety type problems. And it's what's called the inhabited building distance for this. And this is a level where you would expect minor damage to buildings, but the people inside them would be, have a low level of risk of injury. And you can see that the plots are markedly different here. Yeah? And this is a direct result of this urban canyon effect. So here, when we're there, you've obviously got progression of blast up and down the streets and along very easily. And this situation here where the blast is moved to here, it's been, the propagation is shielded by that building there. So the extents of it are really different. So again, just to put it into context, if we use an empirical method, that five kilopascal radius would be there. That's 222 meter radius from there, shown in the same graph. So that empirical equation would seriously overestimate the loads on the building far from the center of the explosion. Yeah? And from a design perspective, that can be really undesirable. Not only if your design, the building your, your design is under attack, but if your building is not the target. Your building is not always the target. So having an understanding of what goes on, and these tools allow us to do a wide range of parameter studies, sensitivity studies, so we can properly understand the design loads that we should be applying to our buildings. So we've done all this analysis. So how do you know it's correct? Yeah? And we, we advocate, and we do this all the time, verification and validation is the key. This gives you the confidence to know that your analysis results are correct. Yeah? You should be doing this for any numerical analysis you're doing, not just a blast analysis. Every structural analysis you do, you should have a means of checking it to make sure it's correct in some way. And verification is not much that you can do about it. That's something that your software company or people who are writing the software does. That's, that's, that's the process of ensuring that the code is doing what it's meant to do. Yeah? And the code should always be developed with that in mind. Validation is really what every analyst should understand. They need to satisfy themselves that the code, any software they're giving is the correct answer. And this is generic, away from BLAST. Um, but it's usually correct in the regime that it's being used in. So if you're doing a nonlinear finite element analysis, make sure you understand it's valid in that nonlinear regime. Yeah? And how we validate the, uh, the software that we're doing, there's only two main methods you can do it. You can check against somebody else's code, which is a good starting point. But the best one is to comparison with actual events or experiments. So 
which just gives you an indication of what we're doing here. This is comparison of our software with another piece of software. In fact, one of our own pieces of software before we made it working on graphics processor units and a code called Air3D, which has been well used in the community as well. And this is just a toy problem with a bomb against a structure and we're monitoring the pressure time history and the impulse time history. So we're fairly happy that we're getting the same answer. Our result here has actually got a finer peak pressure, but that's because we had a finer resolution on that because we could do, because we've got uh, the capability to run it a lot faster. What's really key, this is, so this is some work uh, comparison with experiments. So this is based upon some home office test data. Home office did a whole series of experiments where they looked at a whole series of charge weights and a set height away from a specific structure. They did repeat tests, they did different ranges, they did a whole range of magnitudes and scale distances. And so we compared our results to, in terms of pressure and impulse, and here I've plotted the error, and that 5% circle is a 5% error, and our, our uh, green triangles are our GPU code uh, with a fine resolution, uh, sorry, a low resolution and a finer resolution. And in certain cases, we'd, we'd, get, we'd get errors. Yeah, we're not, we're not saying we're right every time, but what we're saying is we're fairly happy. You've got to have that level of confidence in the results that you're doing. And next is a, a series of specific experiments uh, designed by the US called the Urban Canyon Tests. Yeah, so these were being used as a, the basis for a lot of model comparisons in the US and in the UK to determine how good these blast codes are, what benefit we're getting out of them. And they did a whole pile of tests in the desert with some scale tests, with some simulated concrete structures. They moved them around, they made them taller, they made them uh, 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 wider, they made them hollow. They did a whole sorts of different things to, uh, to test these different pieces of software. We're still waiting for some of our comparison of our results back from what they are, but I do know that they are, they're as good as you saw previously. That's a very typical explosion event from one of those tests. So we've many, many validation examples that we you have got to test your codes and your software all the time. You should always be checking that your results are correct to make sure you're getting the same results each time you do the same thing and for looking at a wide range of different complex situations. So I think that's probably me out of time or close to it. Uh, hopefully you'll have understood what an explosion looks like. We saw the instantaneous rise to peak pressure. We saw the propagation. You saw that increase in duration. Uh, you should be able to identify those three main blast analysis methods. So looking at empirical equations, ray tracing methods, CFD. Uh, you can understand some of the assumptions of the blast analysis tools with the single degree of freedom and the PI curves that we've got there. Hopefully, you would have really appreciated the complexity of the high fidelity CFD blast analysis tools that we've got, and to be able to judge when to use them. When's it, when's it right to use them? You don't need to use them all the time. Yeah, and if you're doing a quick and dirty analysis, that's the first thing you do. You don't, and that's how you check your CFD results as well. And just a final word, always check what you're being told. Never believe anything that, anything that tells you, especially a consultant. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah? always check it. Yeah. Uh, and if there's a difference, understand what the difference is. There may be a good reason for it. It's not necessarily a showstopper. You've just got to check why it's there. Is it reasonable? Is it appropriate? Yeah. Thank you.